for coming this morning. Thanks to Denise for giving me a call and asking me to talk about what the work that PEC has done, but also the work that's being done across the state in terms of land conservation. Um, as she said, my name is Heather Richards. I'm with the Piedmont Environmental Council, and, and I'll get in a minute into um, what we do and where we work. Um, this is a, a barn out in Madison County, and, and you'll see that I have a lot of pictures of really gorgeous farms, and part of that is because a lot of landowners over the past 40 years that PEC has been in existence have made the decision to protect their land for perpetuity. So PEC is a nonprofit environmental organization. We were founded in 1972, and we work in the counties of Loudoun all the way down to Albemarle. Um, this is the northern Piedmont area of Virginia, and we also include Clark County, which is part of the Shenandoah Valley, as part of the territory that we cover. Um, we've been in existence for about 40 years, and throughout that 40 years, we've really focused on dedicating, uh, we're, de we're dedicated to really keeping the Piedmont a vibrant, thriving rural region of the state through land use planning, helping folks do exactly the kinds of things that Tom was talking about earlier, getting involved in their local land use planning, getting involved in land conservation, whether it's just supporting conservation programs or doing conservation on their own properties. We're now involved, very involved in uh, protecting and promoting the rural economy, including local foods and really helping farmers who are doing both traditional and, con and kind of new and innovative agriculture thrive in this new uh, food economy. And we also work with landowners, landowners on improving habitat in their properties. We do this through a lot of different ways. And as Tom said, one of the things that we really do a lot of is reaching out to the communities that we're working in and finding out what's important to them. So if folks come to us and say, we want a trail in a certain area, we'll help that community find that trail. And I've worked with some horse groups in, in Fauquier <laughs> County. We've worked with equestrians in Orange County. We've worked with a number of different folks. But we also let people know about what's going on. Um, this publication here is a clarion. We send those out when there's important issues in a particular county, and they go out to every landowner, um, every resident in a county. But what we do more and more now is we have a really great email list. And you can go on our website, www.pecva.org, and sign up for those emails. We don't flood your email inbox with emails. You can choose what you're interested in. But if you live in a county that we cover, I really strongly encourage you to sign up for those emails to stay informed about those local land use planning issues that can affect you as, a, as an equestrian. We also put out the Buy Fresh by Local Guide. This is part of our rural agricultural program. Um, these are guides that go out to 280,000 households in our region. Every single household in the northern Piedmont get this guide to tell them where they can buy local food. Um, and we're expanding that to start looking at how can we help provide better information on where can you buy local hay? You know, do we have to get our hay imported from Pennsylvania? I mean, I know Tom grows really nice hay up in Pennsylvania in Lancaster, but we can do it here too. So we're looking at how do we expand just from local food to more local feed. This is where I give you my horse cred. Um, I, I'm a rider, I'm a long time equestrian. These are the three horses I currently have on my small farm in Culpeper. And um, I, you know, I, I ride dressage, but I also enjoy hacking out. And I understand the challenges involved in, in keep making sure we still have places to have horse shows, making sure we have places to go fox hunting. Um, I have an incredibly hard time where I live in Culpeper finding a place to ride out. I have to trailer places, even though I have farms around me. Um, it, it's increasingly difficult. So just because I'm a proud mom, Bodhi, Cardoon, and Sundance. Sundance is a pasture ornament. He's a lovely little Welsh pony who has the, lives the life of Riley. Um, I'm not, by the way, a native Virginian. And some Virginians have told me that they can tell that, not because I don't have an accent, but because I talk too fast. I'll be honest, I grew up in New Jersey. But I grew up in the horse country in New Jersey, near the US equestrian uh, team's headquarters in Gladstone. And as someone from that part of the state that used to be very rural, I feel this very, very strongly. Um, I grew up going and spectating at the Essex Horse Trials. That, that was one of the things that made me really say, I want to be an inventor. And then I realized I'm a chicken, and that's why I ride dressage. But you can't see the Essex Horse Trials anymore because that land that the Essex Horse Trials used to be held on that surrounds the use at, at Gladstone is developed. It's a golf course and a housing development. So you know, we're really working in Virginia to make sure that that doesn't happen here. And, and um, Robert Duvall is a good friend to the PEC actor, Robert Duvall. He does a lot of 
um, presentations for us. And one of the things that he says that always strikes me, and, and I feel this very strongly, is for him and his wife, Luciana, Virginia is the last stop before heaven. And God, I hope that's true for me because it is a special, special place. So I feel it personally because I, I love the landscape here. I love the history here. But we have to protect land for a lot of different reasons. And I'll get into the horse-related reasons in a minute. But there's a lot of different things that land conservation writ large all across the state are giving us. Um, you know, we have, you know, the, the land in our, in our region provides food. It provides a sustainable natural environment, provides jobs and, all, and, a, and a vibrant economy. I'll get into that in a minute places to recreate, places to get outside, and historic and scenic places that we need to experience that are important to us as a nation and, as a, and a, a culture. So we're providing a broad range of public benefits. And you know, I'm often asked, why should we bother conserving large quantities of land? You know, shouldn't we just kind of take more of the national park approach and figure out this little spot over here is really special and we'll protect that little spot over there and they can be museums of what was important. And my answer to that is, you know, we, we have to protect the larger landscape. The connection to place is not just in going to Yellowstone or going to Shenandoah National Park. It's the drive and getting there. And we see that in study after study. When you're in Shenandoah National Park, when you're on Skyline Drive, how many people think that when you're on Skyline Drive, you're looking at the National Park? You're not, you're looking at private land. So those connections, those, in, those places in between are exceptionally special places, are important to preserve for a lot of reasons. Um, so what the other important thing to know is that land trusts in Virginia and organiz organizations, people who are conserving land in Virginia, are doing this in a very strategic way. Um, the map that Tom showed before shows a lot of little green dots on the map. And that's the result of 40 years of conservation work in the northern Piedmont. But what it doesn't show is all of the important resources that those little dots uh, protect collectively, and I'll get into that now. So one of the things, of the 725,000 acres protected with conservation easements in Virginia, and that's a really remarkable number for a state like Virginia where we're doing it the hard way. I joke with my colleagues in Montana, they had a goal of protecting a million acres of ranch land in Montana, and they did it in 10 years. But they do it the easy way, like 10 and 15,000 acres at a time. In Virginia, we're doing it the hard way. We're doing it at 100, 200 acres at a time. So 725,000 acres protected with easements is a lot of individual landowners. But of those 725,000 acres, 48% of those acres are lands that were identified by the State Department of Conservation and Recreation as having high ecological value. This isn't random. This isn't just some land. These are lands that are providing important um, <laughs> benefits to the entire Commonwealth. We're also protecting water quality and supply. Um, just to orient you, this is Middleburg right here. Leesburg is up here, and you've got the Potomac River. So this is Loudoun County and northern Fauquier County. And everything in blue is the Goose Creek watershed. Goose Creek provides drinking water for uh, the city, city of Fairfax and much of eastern Loudoun County. So a lot of people rely on that watershed. If we paved over that watershed, um, we would have poorer water quality requiring much higher water filtration costs. And we also wouldn't have as much water because water wouldn't seep into the ground and filter slowly into the stream. It would just wash directly into the stream. So in this watershed, we have about 88,000 acres of permanently conserved land, ensuring not only that we have clean water today, but that we'll continue to have a supply of clean water in the future. Um, more than 34,000 of those acres have been conserved since the year 2000. And I'll get into that, uh, why that is a little bit more later. But in addition to just protecting the land and making sure houses aren't built on it, People on, on all of these easements are protecting forested riparian buffers, which as Willie talked about before, these resource protection areas that help filter the runoff from all of those horse farms that are producing manure. Um, and they're keeping that, that nitrogen and phosphorus from getting into the, the creeks and streams, making sure we have healthy places to fish, making sure we have clean drinking water. Another big important reason for protecting land in Virginia is this is where people come to recreate. And our tourism, our heritage, and our cultural resources are an incredibly important industry. $16 billion annually. Um, when you break that down into what is it meaning to our localities, it's helping to fund our schools. It's helping to fund our fire departments. 
um, nearly $700 million in state tax receipts and $435 million in uh, revenues to localities. And people don't come here to see our subdivisions. When folks drive, when Tom drives back to uh, Pennsylvania on the journey through hallowed ground, he's driving from uh, Monticello in Charlottesville to Montpelier, Madison's home, on the same road that looks a lot the same as when Mr. Jefferson went to visit his friend Mr. Madison and when Mr. Madison reciprocated along the same road. That's the experience that people are coming here to see. And if we develop those, those lands, we lose that. We lose that tourism industry. So supporting land conservation now helps ensure that we have that industry in time to come. This is a, a project that I'm working on in, in Fauquier County on the border of Fauquier and Culpeper. Rappahannock Station is a battlefield park. Um, this is a, was an important, the Rappahannock River, for those of you who don't follow the Civil War um, history, was a very important dividing line. It was much fought over. And this particular crossing of the Rappahannock was much, much fought over. There were two battles that were fought at this ford. Um, this is an area that has significant recreational use, but it's all illegal because there's no place you can legally put a boat in the water. So we're helping to preserve land both along the river so that when people can put a boat legally in the water, they can, uh, they can see a beautiful landscape along the river. But we're also helping to acquire access sites like this one so that people can legally get onto the Rappahannock. So now we're getting closer back to the horse industry. Um, agriculture and forestry are Virginia's number one industries. Uh, a, a study from a few years ago say that they contribute $47 billion annually and comprise more than 15% of total employment. Um, but we're losing that land at an incredibly high rate. Um, the, the figure that I believe the Governor Kane liked to quote most was, we are developing more land in the next 40 years than were developed in the first 400 years of Virginia's existence. We're going from this to this, and that's Loudoun County. So supporting land conservation you know, ensures that we have these basic inputs. You know, just protecting land is not going to save agriculture, but if we don't have the land, we're not gonna have agriculture. Um, statewide easements have conserved 300,000 acres of land containing just prime agricultural soils. That doesn't include the vast number of acres in statewide important agricultural soils. And locally, counties are really understanding that this is an important thing that they have to do as well, not just to support, not just to have beautiful open places, but to support their industry, to support the businesses that are really making their, their communities hum. Um, you know, thriving farm communities mean that we have communities that still have feed stores, tractor mechanics, um, I used to live in Winchester, and one of the saddest days for me was when I could no longer go down to Winchester Feed and Seed because it closed. That's one of the benefits of land conservation. You still have farmers, you still have the businesses that support farmers, and those businesses provide income and jobs for every community. But why should you all care, your horse folks? You know, I mean, you, you may care, you may be interesting, but what's the direct relation to horses? Well, for one, these are big animals and they need places to live. And without the land, access to land, we're gonna all end up, you know, like, like a lot of my old friends in New Jersey, having horses on two acres that get to go out for in their little dry lot. And I think a lot of folks in Virginia think, I don't wanna do that. I want my horses out in a big green pasture that I've spent a lot of time renovating and making ecologically sound. Um, so places to keep our horses is a, is a big important reason. Land to produce food for them. Um, I hate having to buy hay from my feed store because I know that they import it from Pennsylvania and places further north. Um, it's lovely hay, but it's darn expensive, especially as the cost of diesel goes up. It's not particularly ecologically friendly, which, which, makes, which is important to me personally. So as long as I, I'm helping the guy down the road put an easement on his farm, he's a huge hay farmer, I can buy my hay from him. It's really important to, to think about where we're going to get our hay for our, these animals down the road. Places to enjoy our horses and enjoy looking at other people's horses. Um, this is Glenwood Park just outside of Middleburg. PEC helped uh, the, the owners of Glenwood Park put this property under easement a few years ago. This is where the Middleburg races are held. It's also where the uh, Commonwealth Dressage and Combined Training Association now holds a dressage show in August. Um, Pony Club holds events here. 
But there's a lot of other places that are important to enjoying our horses that, that are protected or should be protected. Our national forests and the land adjacent to them, national parks, Upperville Horse Show Grounds, more on that later, Morven Park, um, trails and access to wildlife management areas. How many people here ride in your wildlife management areas near you? Incredibly important and we need more of them and better access to trails there. One of the things PEC and other land trusts are doing is helping the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries acquire additional land for, for wildlife management areas. Um, another example that I'll give you, this is Orange County, Montpelier down here. And we've been working in the community to look at whether it's possible to put a trail in from Willow Grove all the way down to Montpelier that could be walked on or, or, <laughs> or ridden on. The important piece for land conservation is this piece right here is called Andrusia. Um, back in the 2004, 2005, this property was bought by a development company. It was approved for 319 houses. This trail is not gonna be possible as long as you're gonna build 319 houses on it because let's face it, folks living on a quarter acre lot don't want people riding through their backyard. Fortunately, the developer developed some sense and realized that this wasn't going to be a profitable development and gave the property to PEC and it's now, now protected by a conservation easement. So this trail connection, if we can make all of the other ones necessary to get down to Montpelier, is possible. It won't be stopped by development. Another reason land conservation is important. I think one of the things that speaks the most to me about the importance of land conservation is that aspect of community. Um, without land conservation without access to land to have our horses live on, to board on, to recreate on. We don't have people in our neighborhood that do the same things as we do. How much harder is it to get a farrier if you're the only horse person in the county? How much harder is it to get access to good veterinary services if you don't have a thriving horse community? The land is the key input for making all of that possible. Doesn't make sure that it happens, but if you don't have the land, if you don't have access to land, that can't happen. You don't have kids that can go out in Pony Club and you know, ride their horses on beautiful farms and compete and learn and develop that sense of community. One of the places, one of the things that makes Virginia such a great place to be a horse person is that we have this community and I think it's really important not to lose it. So, <coughs> There's a huge economic importance of equines in Virginia, and I think this speaks to the importance of keeping the land available for horses. It's an annual economic impact of $1.2 billion, and if any of you have not seen the Weldon Cooper study that was published in 2011, 2012, um, I highly recommend you, you look it up on the internet. Um, incredible information about the state of the horse industry. 16,000 jobs. In this you know, economy where we're all talking about where do we find jobs, Horses are a place that provide jobs. Agriculture is a place that provides jobs. $65 million in taxes. We're paying our fair share. We're all spending, I always laugh at this, an average of $4,000 per horse. I always think that sounds low. We have, you know, to the tourism side of that, 939,000 people attending horse shows in Virginia in one year. It's a tremendous amount of economic activity, whether it's people coming here or people traveling from one part of the state to another. another. Out-of-town attendees spend an average of $3,100 on a horse show. I go to Lexington. I'm, I live about two hours away from the Horse Center. That's what this picture is here, is the Virginia Horse Center. Um, I have to spend the night in a hotel. I eat in the restaurants. So does everybody else that's filling up that Horse Center. This is an incredibly important economic driver. They're the ninth largest agricultural commodity. I've heard people say all oh, horses aren't agriculture. I challenge them to come out to any of our farms and tell us that after shoveling that 20.5 tons of manure that we deal with every year. It's no wonder horse people are strong. It's the bales of hay and shoveling all that manure. So again, you know, land conservation itself isn't the only tool for success in making sure that all of this stays possible. But it, without it, we don't have any of this. Without that land, without that access to land, we lose our ability to have this incredible industry. So that gives you an, an idea of why we should conserve land and why it's important, but who's actually doing this? I mean, there are actual people behind all these decisions. First of all, some of the people doing it are, are people like PEC, organizations like PEC, we're land trusts. 
Uh, we're a nonprofit organization that has, at least as part of its mission, um, actively working to conserve land by undertaking or assisting land conservation or easement acquisition. And then we steward those easements. So we make sure that those easements stay open and that people are upholding the terms of those easements in the future. Um, there's 39 land trusts in Virginia, give or take. Five of those land trusts are accredited by the National Land Trust Accreditation Commission. But there's also a lot of important state activity on land conservation, VOF. The Virginia Outdoors Foundation is the largest easement holder in the state. Um, they are also one of the largest easement holders in the country. And they've been around since 1966. They are very good at helping folks conserve land. The Department of Forestry is a very active easement holder, as is the Department of Historic Resources. And the Department of Conservation and Recreation acquires land for public access. Um, I should have added the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries because they also do uh, wildlife management areas. And as I said, PEC is working with them on potentially um, getting some more. So PEC has a very long history, given where we're located in working with equestrians. Um, it started about 40 years ago, largely with fox hunts. Um, these were folks who said, if we don't protect our territory, if we don't keep it open, we're not going to have a place to hunt. And I think that was particularly important for folks from the Orange County hunt who are not named for Orange County, Virginia. They're named for Orange County, New York. And they came to Virginia because they didn't have territory to hunt anymore. Um, Orange County alone is, rep is responsible and their members are responsible for protecting over 40,000 acres of their hunting territory. Um, this includes many of their fixtures, the land that they ride across. And that is due in large part to leadership among those hunt members. Um, PEC's former board chair, Eve Fout, was a, a devoted fox hunter. And she harried the members of the Orange County hunt about conserving their land at every opportunity. Um, in the politest way possible. But it's the leadership of folks like, like Eve and, and in far, at the Farmington Hunt, over 68,000 acres protected. John Birdsell, who's currently on PEC's board of directors, has been a force for conservation in Farmington. Um, and it's because of these individuals talking to their neighbors about conservation. They're doing it themselves on their own property. Both uh, John Birdsell and, and the Felt family have protected thousands of acres of lands themselves but then they're talking to their neighbors. And I think you as equestrians, as, as farm owners, as landowners, should talk to your neighbors. Maybe you don't have a farm that can be conserved. I only live on 10 acres. It's not really a, a conservation easement prospect, but I certainly take the opportunity to talk to my larger farm neighbors about conserving their land. Um, we're also work, working with other hunts in our area. We have quite a few. Um, Orange County, Farmington, Bull Run, Keswick. Um, all of the, the support of all of the members of these hunts who may, may or may not be landowners um, has helped to increase the land ethic in, this, in the region. But there's other folks. Fox hunters were among the first people, I think, to recognize the need for land conservation. Certainly the folks who, who do primarily trail riding and endurance riding really understand the need to be able to get out for a, for a full day. Um, but some of the next folks who really came on board were eventers because they need places to condition so we've got Karen O'Connor and Teddy the Wonder Pony. They event and, and train at least part of the year out of Jacqueline Mars's farm in the Plains, mostly conserved. The retirement home of Kim, Kim Severson's Winsome Adante, plain dealing farm under conservation easement for about six years. Paige Johnson, going into the show jumping world, trains out of Salamander Farm in Middleburg, also conserved. Upperville Horse Show Grounds, this is important both because it's the heart of horse country in, in part of the area that we work in. Um, storied, legendary facility. Uh, this is actually the Fout family at uh, Family Hunt Day at the Upperville Horse Show. Conserved Horse Show Grounds, very important so we don't lose that. The farms surrounding the Horse Show Grounds, part of what makes Upperville such a beautiful place to visit, also conserved. Um, up here, this is Pleasant Colony, the winner of the 1981 Kentucky Derby in Preakness, bred and retired at Buckland Farm in Prince William County, actually on the border of Fauquier and Prince William County. Most of Buckland is now preserved with conservation easements. It's an incredibly historic farm. Uh, the house itself has actually been conserved with a conservation easement, but much of the land has now been conserved. On the bottom here, we have Rokeby Farm. If anybody's in the Upperville area at the end of May, I highly recommend the Upperville uh, Hunt Country Stable Tour. 
where you get to see Rokeby. This is the Mellon Farm. Uh, many, many legendary racehorses. I'm not a racing aficionado, so I'm sure there are people here who could give me a better idea of the important horses who have come from here. But all of the Mellon estate was conserved with conservation easement, and it's significant road frontage, incredibly scenic, and it's part of what makes the experience of driving and riding in that area really special. Um, other notable farms that PECs worked with, North Wales, one of the larger thoroughbred breeding operations until a few years ago is conserved. It's over, over 1,200 acres, I believe, in Fauquier County. Hickory Tree Farm, Smitten Farm, also thoroughbred breeding operations in northern Fauquier, also conserved for quite a long time. So these are all the exciting places that, that we've seen conserved, um, but why do people do this? I mean, it, they're, they're protecting their land. What does that mean? They're restricting development. They're giving up development rights. They're giving up the rights to do a lot of things on their property. And there's really three reasons why landowners do it. The first reason is that they love their land. The second reason is that they love their land. And the third reason is because they love their land. They might be interested in doing it for their community, and that makes, makes them feel good. But really, the heart of it, there's nobody that does a conservation easement that doesn't do it because they love their land. Um, this isn't a, a money maker. You know, they might make some money back because they might be eligible for federal state um, income tax incentives, some estate tax benefits, there's sometimes some property tax savings to be had, but that doesn't make up for the value that they're giving up by not developing their property. So why a conservation easement is, is kind of a couple of reasons. It keeps working lands working for the long term. If you're not building houses on your property, if you're not building a Walmart there, you're not building a widget factory, property is available for farming. You can foster continued use of good management practices in the future. A lot of people who put in riparian buffers, um, they institute some pasture renovation, they do reforestation on certain areas. They want to make sure that the investments that they're making in their lifetime can continue on into the future because let's face it, planting a forest or a riparian buffer is a long-term investment. You know, it's not something you put in one year and take out the next year. So easements can help make sure that those investments that you're making in good management on your farm today are carried forward into the future. And then the bigger benefits to the community that we, we've talked about so far. So things a conservation easement is not. These are not temporary. It provides permanent protection and it runs with the land. So if you protect your land with a conservation easement, it will be binding on your heirs or whoever you sell your property to but it allows you to give the property to, your, to the next generation. It allows you to sell it. It can allow you to do a variety of other things with the property, but it is permanent. It's also not like a right-of-way easement that provides access to the public or your neighbors. Some easements provide public access, but they don't have to, and that's a really important point to remember. It's also not a conspiracy by the United Nations. I, did not, I was not sent here from New York. <laughs> I don't carry a copy of Agenda 21 with me. But what does it do? It's flexible. It's tailored to meet the needs of each individual property owner. And sometimes I go out and I meet with folks and we talk about an easement and they might be very interested, but what we find out is that I can't be flexible enough because we do have rules. There are rules for it. But it is generally flexible. There's not a one-size-fits-all. We don't walk into a landowner and say, here's your easement. It would be so much easier if we did. But um, but it's not. Every property is different, every landowner is different, every family is different. And for that reason, every easement is different and has to really meet the, need, the, the vision that each landowner has for their property. What it will do is it will limit subdivision and what, what are called incompatible uses. A Walmart's an incompatible use, so is a widget factory. <coughs> there may be other incompatible uses like a large farm market. <coughs> But that's where it gets into tailoring it to fit your individual needs and the needs of, of uh, the, the laws that govern conservation easements. And they typically incorporate best management practices. One of the things that we see in almost every easement in Virginia now is a requirement that you have some sort of riparian buffer along your streams, that livestock be fenced out of those streams. Um, we certainly work with landowners. I work with a lot of landowners who want to do an easement. They don't have the stream fencing. And we hook them up with folks at the Soil and Water Conservation District who can help get them the cost share that they need to make that buffer a reality. But it'll also require things like a forest stewardship plan for your, for your forest management. So there'll also be some limits on the number and possibly the size of houses or accessory structures. You remember, one of the things that we're protecting in conservation easement 
in a, in a conservation easement is the scenic beauty. If you're on a scenic byway, let's say, if you're on the journey through hallowed ground, we might ask that if you're going to build another house, you build it in the back of the property or that you build it not higher than a certain height so it minimizes the visual impact on that scenic byway that drives our tourism industry. It'll prohibit industrial and commercial use. Again, the Walmart, the widget factory, not, not so good for easements. And then there's a whole bunch of legalese. That, all that stuff takes up about four pages of the document, and then you've got another 30 pages of legalese. And it's all to satisfy the IRS. So what does the IRS have to do with this? And I, I will say, I really was just looking for a place to use this picture, and I didn't realize until afterwards that I had put it on the IRS slide. Sorry to the IRS if there's anybody here. I just thought it was a cute picture. <laughs> so the, the tax code provides a charitable deduction for the donation of a conservation easement. So if you give money to the Red Cross, let's say, or to your church, you get to take a tax deduction on your, state, on your federal income taxes. Giving an easement is much the same. It is a charitable contribution, and that's one of the important things to remember. Going back to the beginning, why do people do this? They're not doing it because they're, by and large, getting back the whole value of what they're giving up. Almost everyone who does an easement in Virginia is making some sort of charitable contribution. So the IRS, in order to get this charitable contribution, has some basic requirements. First of all, it has to, the easement has to have some public benefit. This can't just be beca because you love your land. That's a good reason for you to do it. But for the IRS to give you something in return, a, a tax deduction, it has to have public benefit. So first of all, it could protect scenic or open space. And this, pr this includes farmland and forest land. It could protect what's called relatively natural habitat for fish and wildlife. That's directly out of the tax code. There's some real great terms of art in the tax code. Relief from urban closeness is a potential public purpose. Um, but natural habitat for fish and wildlife doesn't mean that you have to have a snail darter on your property. This can be habitat for bobwhite quail. It can be habitat for brook trout. It can be habitat for a variety of things. It doesn't have to be a threatened or endangered species. It could protect historically important land or a certified historic structure. If you have a house that's on the National Register, um, if your land is within a rural historic district or within a battlefield, those are qualified purposes for a conservation easement. Or it could preserve land for recreation by the public. Most people don't use that one because most easements in Virginia are not open for the public to walk on. They're open for the public to look at from, from roadways. They're open for the public to benefit from the drinking water that they get off of that property. But most folks don't choose to open their land for recreation to the public. So some other IRS requirements, again, prohibiting any inconsistent uses. Um, so if you're protecting land for a, a scenic purposes along, a, along that scenic byway, you can't build a giant house right on the road that impedes the scenic purpose of the easement. You have to give your easement to a qualified conservation organization. So what does that mean? Virginia Outdoors Foundation, all of those organizations and state agencies I mentioned before are qualified conservation organizations. PEC is a qualified conservation organization. Your easement, back to that, it's not temporary thing. In order to get a tax benefit, you have to make your easement enforceable in perpetuity. And that means two things, actually. It means that the document has to be written to be enforceable in perpetuity. It has to say that in the easement. But you also have to give your easement to an organization that's going to be around or is planning to be around in perpetuity. And one of the ways that we do that, PEC is a large stewardship fund um, that we use to make sure that if PEC went out of business and we stopped doing all of those other things that I talked about right off the bat, that we would still have a fund that would generate enough interest every year to pay someone to go out and make sure that those easements are being upheld. That's what we mean by enforceable in perpetuity. And we have to have access to monitor the property. We, it's not good enough you don't just record your easement and we all go away happy. We come out and visit with our landowners every year. It's actually one of the best parts of the job. I, I've made some really incredible friends. I've done, been doing land conservation for about 12 years now in, in Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland. Um, and some of the landowners that I get to visit with every year, it's, it's a highlight of the year for me. We go out, we walk around the property, they talk to me about what their kids are doing, what their plans are for the property. Um, but that access, our ability to go on the property and make sure that the terms are being upheld is very important. And if there's a mortgage on the property, you have to get the consent of the mortgage holder. So all of this is because you get a charitable tax deduction, but what's the value of that charitable tax deduction, that charitable donation? Um, the first thing you want to do to figure that out is you hire a good appraiser. 
This isn't the guy that did your real estate appraisal for you know, buying your residential house. This is a very specialized field of appraisal. There's actually only a handful of really good appraisers in the state. But what they'll do is they'll look first at, let's say you're not restricting your property. What could you sell this land for today on the open market? And then they'll say, well, if you restrict the property and say that 200 acres, you can only build two houses instead of 10 houses, what is that land worth then? And the difference between those two values is the value of your conservation easement. So for example, if your land was worth a million dollars before the easement, and it's worth $700,000 after the easement, your easement was worth, your easement value is $300,000. So tax benefits, there's that charitable tax deduction that works for both the federal income taxes and your state income taxes. It carries over from your federal to your state. In Virginia, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute, we have an incredibly good Virginia land preservation tax credit. And this is a dollar for dollar credit on the state income taxes you owe. Land and easement also automatically qualifies for land use property taxes. There's some estate tax benefits. So on, this, on the federal side, the size of your deduction is equal to the easement value. So if you have that $300,000, and I'll go through an example in a minute with real numbers, um, your size of your deduction is equal to the easement value and subject to an annual limitation. So essentially, you can deduct up to 50% of your adjusted gross income based on that, that easement value each year. If you're a qualified farmer, meaning you get 50, more than 50% of your income from farming every year, you can deduct 100% of your income for that, with that easement valuation. Um, any excess contributions, so say you've got that 300,000, you can only deduct 50,000 in the first year, you can ca keep carrying it forward until you use up that entire 300,000 or 15 years out, whichever comes first. I will say this deduction at 50% with a 15 year carry forward is only good this year. Um, we've had extensions every year, they extended it again during the fiscal cliff negotiations. We're trying to get it extended again next year, but if you're thinking about doing an easement, don't wait, because we don't know that it'll be this good in the future. It may go back to a 30% deduction on AGI with only a five-year carry forward. So that federal income tax deduction carries forward on your state income taxes. But we also have this income tax credit, and this is what has really driven land conservation over the past 12 years. The Land Preservation Tax Credit was implemented in 2000, and it allows for an income tax credit, a dollar for dollar credit against taxes due, equal to 40% of the value of the easement. You can individually use up to $100,000 a year and carry it forward for an additional 10 years. Um, using $100,000 a year on your income taxes in Virginia, is you have a fabulously high in income. Um, What's made this so important to land conservation in Virginia is that that tax credit's transferable. Most people in Virginia aren't paying that much in, in income taxes, and if you have a $300,000 easement value or a million dollar easement value, which isn't outside the realm of possibility in a lot of areas of the state, you're never gonna use all of that income tax credit yourself. So what you can do in Virginia is you can either sell those credits or, or give those credits to family, friends, or neighbors, or you can hire a tax credit broker to sell those credits for you, and you get cash back. Um, people are selling credits at the end of 2010, they were selling credits at an incredibly high value of 85 to 90 cents on the dollar. So if you had that you know, $100,000 in income tax credits, you might have received back 75 or $80,000 in cash for selling those credits. So it's not just a tax deduction, you can actually get cash back. Property taxes. Uh, land subject to a conservation easement in Virginia is automatically taxed at the land use rate um, for open space in that locality. So if, you're, if your community has a, a land use taxation structure, you would no longer have to certify annually that you're getting $1,500 a year off your property. You're automatically taxed at the land use rate. And there's also some estate tax benefits. There's a handful of landowners out there who are very, very land rich and cash poor. And they receive a property through an estate, and unfortunately, the cost of the estate taxes, and this is a pretty small percentage of people, but in a, land, in a state as with expensive land like Virginia, it's particularly important. Um, you know, when the land passes into the estate, it goes to the heirs, the heirs might have to sell that property. 
An easement can auto, can already lower the value of the property of, of the e, prop, of the value of the property to the estate. And then you can exclude as much as 40% of the value of the property from the value of the taxable estate. So what this can do when it, when it works out right is that it can actually bring the value of a property, the value of an estate down low enough so that it's below the threshold for having to pay estate taxes at all. And I've worked with a handful of landowners who have actually been able to take advantage of that, keep the land in the family, keep it working, and not have to sell the land for, to pay estate taxes. Um, it's, as I said, it's a very few number of landowners that this actually impacts, but it's incredibly important when you're talking often about very large pieces of land. So, an example, and then I promise I'll let you all eat lunch. Um, if your annual adjusted gross income is $120,000, and you, this is based on that $300,000 number that we had before, your maximum annual deduction would be $60,000. So you're deducting 50% of your AGI, Meaning that you're only being taxed, instead of being taxed on $120,000, you're being taxed on $60,000. And your deduction that you use up over five years is you would use up that whole $300,000. And you'd save about $84,000 in taxes, in, in federal income taxes. Your Virginia tax savings, um, I'm sorry, yep, I did that right. So looking at your Virginia deduction, you save a total of uh, $3,400 a year for a total of $17,000 or so over, the, over a number of years. But then you have those income tax credits. So that brings your income tax savings up to $93,000 and you still have this remaining $26,000 of income tax credits that you couldn't use yourself that you could sell to somebody else. So taken all together, that, in, that appraised easement value of $300,000, you've got your $84,000 in federal income tax savings over the course of your easement, about $17,000 in savings on your income taxes in Virginia. You'd use about $93,000 in state income tax credits. You'd sell those $26,000 in state income tax credits for about $20,000. And so your total savings is about $200,000 is a very kind of storybook, perf everything all stars align kind of example. But it gives you an idea of how, the, how these tax benefits can really line up with each other to somewhat make up for the value that you're losing in your property. And at the end of this, you still own your property. You can still give it to your children. You can still live on it. You can still have your horses on it. You're getting some compensation through the tax code for making the donation and making the decision to protect your land. So with that, I'll take any questions. Yep. Yeah. One on that slide previous, over what period of time is that, that savings? Is that a five year? This, because of the value and the tax rate that we use, this is about over five years. Five years, and then after five years, there's real, the savings is gone, if you will, but you preserve the Correct, but the land, land under easement will continue to appreciate in value. A lot. You know, what, what you're doing is you're taking it from up here, bringing the value down here, and then it will continue to go up with the rest of, or down with the rest of the real estate market. Do you ever redo this? You know, at some future point, no. say? You never read, so no. it's a one time. That's why I said this isn't, this isn't a money-making right. venture. I mean, people who do this really need to love their land and, and want to do this for the long term. In the, in the short term, it's certainly. And you know what? One of the one of the things that we found is that some farmers are doing this, especially larger farmers are doing this, and they're reinvesting, especially the tax credits. If they can't use the tax credits themselves, they're reinvesting that money into the farm. Um, I've worked with a, a dairy farmer in Fauquier County who we bought an easement. Uh, again, he still donated a fair fair amount of the value, but we bought the easement. He went out and he bought more land. He protected that land. He took the money that he got from protecting that land, put it back into the farm. And you know, is re he's really trying to, to make sure that he's got enough land for all of his children to, to farm in the future. So if they were to sell it, the easement goes with the deed, right? Correct. It goes to the new owners. The new owners then, of course, if you're buying land, you want to see whether or not an easement already exists on that land, mm -hmm. right? Because you're not going to get a benefit from that easement. It's already been taken, correct? Correct. The income tax benefits have already been taken. The land use property valuation would continue right into the future. Yeah. You mentioned some laws that govern conservation easements. Is there a 
body of the law? There are a number of laws that govern easements in Virginia. Um, the first one that we always look to when drafting easements is the IRS tax, is the tax code. Um, so that's the first one. The other two, three laws actually that govern easements in Virginia are the Open Space Land Act, the Virginia Conservation Easement Act, and the Land Preservation Tax Credit section of the code. Um, the Open Space Land Act and the Virginia Conservation Easement Act are the laws that say who is a qualified holder in Virginia of easements, who, um, you know, what kind of land should be protected, um, what the rules are for extinguishing an easement. Uh, so if, if an easement needs to be condemned for the purposes of a road or a power, a transmission line or a railroad, it, those laws have the, the rules that govern that in it. And then the Land Preservation Tax Credit Code, because the state is giving such a generous benefit for, uh, for land conservation, they give a, there are additional requirements, especially if your easement's valued over a certain amount of money that you have to have certain requirements in your easement. Um, so those are the four main bodies of law that we look at for conservation easements. There are other laws that govern easements. Real estate, it is a real estate document, a real estate instrument, so laws that govern real estate also govern easements um, in various ways. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? Well, they're all horse friendly. <laughs> um, you mean in terms of having? You mean in terms of allowing access? No, in terms of allowing horses on the roadway. I don't know of any easements in our region that would not allow horses on th that would that prohibit horses in the easement. They are not open to the public, however. So, did, did I did I answer your question? I mean, there, I don't know of any easements that, that we've done in our area that we've been associated with that say you can't keep horses on this property. That would be that's not something we can manage. In an easement? Do any of your easements specify horseshoes? No. When one of the and the reason for that is, is that one of the things that we look at in an easement is we have to be able to enforce it in perpetuity. And the only way I had someone suggest to me recently that they wanted to have an easement that they that dogs weren't allowed on. And I'm like, well, okay, but I can't enforce that. Like I don't know if someone's out there tomorrow with a dog or the next day with a dog. I come out once or twice a year and check on the easement. So the easements are really written for things that we can look at on an annual basis. Um, speaking from, so that, that's kind of the larger atmospherics of it. From PEC's perspective, we don't want to get involved in telling, what, telling a landowner, you have to do this kind of farming, or you can't do that kind of farming, or you should be growing this or growing that. Number one, we're not the experts at it, but you know, things change. And you know, horses may be really valuable today, but 10 years from now, we could all be mutton busting and riding cheap. So I, you know, I, I don't know, and we don't want to get into that level of detail with, with landowners in the easements. That's why we do all, that's why PEC does all of the other things that we do. There's another question here. Is there any program or thinking towards linear easements or lines of communication easements where there would have public access to using land? Yeah, there, there are a number of, um, you know, I've certainly, I've worked with the Culpeper Horse Owners <laughs> Association and, you know, what kind of documents would they need to get trail easements across properties? Um, you know, the, the biggest challenge there is not that the legal instruments don't exist or that the interest in doing that doesn't exist among land trusts. It's getting landowners to allow that kind of access. That's the first hurdle to, to overcome. So it's, you know, we're, I've worked with folks on that. We, we're working with the folks in Orange County um, looking at how we make that happen. But it's that first landowner willingness hurdle that we have to overcome. The Ravana Trails Foundation actually has been very successful in getting linear easements and access to properties to cre create a loop around Charlottesville. Um, that's not a horse trail per se, but it's, it, you know, it is an example of how it can be done. So. More questions? I'd be curious, uh, not necessarily you, but uh, does, if you're going to do this easement, you should start on it this year, and because there's a certain amount of the government. But how long is going to start, say, next week? How long would be typical? Uh, Three to six months from, just from the time that you say, I yes, absolutely want to do this to the time that you go to recordation or closing on the easement. Um, and that can be shorter or longer depending on the easement holder that you're working with. I would say the state agencies tend to take a little bit longer. The private land trusts can get things done a little bit more quickly. Um, but yeah, it's, it averages three to six months. I, say, I think my record speed in doing an easement was I got one done in six weeks once and I about died doing it. 
um, and so did the landowners. <laughs> there's just a lot of, there's title work, there's a whole bunch of documentation that has to get done. The back and forth with a 30 page legal document takes some time, so. Um, but yeah, if, you know, if anyone's thinking about doing this, this is the year to do it. You know, people always say, ah, oh, I can put that off, I can wait, and, and we just don't know what the tax benefits are gonna be. I think we're gonna continue to have the Virginia Income Tax Credit, Land Preservation Tax Credit for the next few years because of a bill that was passed this year in the General Assembly. I don't know about the federal income tax deduction. I'll be perfectly honest. We're working really hard with a lot of other land trusts across the country, but you guys know what's happening in Washington right now, and we're stuck with everybody else not knowing how that's going to pan out. So if you're thinking of doing it, do it this year. Nope. Doesn't make any difference. It takes us just as much work, time, energy, everything as, unfortunately, small properties protected by easements don't actually have shorter easements. <laughs> They're still 30 pages long. Thank you. Sure. Yep. What about a good size easement? It depends on where you are. Um, you know, people ask me all the time, is my property big enough for an easement? And I, the, the general answer is, is that there's not a hard cutoff. If you're in Fairfax County, 10 acres might be a good easement if you have important resources on that 10 acres that are gonna be protected. If you're in Culpeper County and you have a historic building in downtown Culpeper on a 10th of an acre lot, that might be a, in, an important historic easement. Most of the easements that PEC works on are 40 to 50 acres and larger, um, and that's because that's what's important in the landscape that we're working in. Um, I just did an easement, actually. I, I meant to mention it before, a really great horse breeding farm, uh, Merrifield Meadows, was just recorded on an even easement uh, this week, and that was a 42-acre horse farm, um, but it has a historic house on it, it has a very historic cemetery, and it has a lot of road frontage on a scenic byway, which meant that we were willing to take something a little bit on the smaller side because there were important resources to protect. Yeah, follow-up? <laughs> no, you, you, yeah, you had a follow-up? Yeah. Um, do you deal with the same people for historic easements as land easements? No, it would be a little bit different. Um, the, if it's a historic conservation easement on a building, on a specific building, that would be the Department of Historic Resources. Um, most other easements, you've got a lot of other op options. So. Other questions? Um, just one. Denise? Uh, and then I think we need to, to go. Um, do your clients work with a, uh, a legal representative that is well-versed in conservation easements? Yeah, every landowner that we work with, we recommend that they work with a, a, an attorney. I mean, they, they need to have, you need to have your own legal representation, your own, someone who's advising you. Because as a land trust, we're not trying to get one over on you, but we're not representing you. We have to represent our interests. We recommend that you work with your own attorney. And we also recommend that you work with an attorney that understands conservation easements. Um, Number one, it'll save you money if they're not learning on your guinea pig project. Um, but it also, you know, there's a lot of law that goes into this. There's a lot of tax law that goes into this. There's court cases. You know, understanding, having someone who understands that is really important. 